covered heaviness with garments of praise. You wrote a song and you sing it at over me. I feel a dead heart beating now. This revelation makes me want to shout that Jesus has been
can't help speaking truth when I can't find. Light up this broken heart and light my way till my time on earth is done. As the clouds he rides smooth, lift up the sound as he makes a crazy song.
Good morning, church. It's great to see everybody here this morning. I want to uh, just welcome you on behalf of First United Methodist Church of Sulphur Springs to a, a wonderful spring day and a beautiful weekend. I hope you've had an opportunity to get out and enjoy uh, the beautiful sunshine yesterday. And uh, it's supposed to be warming up a little bit this week, and so uh, we're excited about that. But, um, but thank you for being here today. Again, as beautiful as it has been this weekend, I know a lot of people um, have a lot of options, and we're, we're excited that you're here with us. And if you're joining us online this morning, I want to say welcome to you, and thank you for, for being present with us this morning. I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day of worship. Uh, just a few... Um, Things I want to point out. First of all, if you are a visitor with us, uh, just uh, we, we remind you of this weekly, but uh, if you are new to us today, just and want to get plugged in to know what's happening at First United Methodist Church, you can simply text uh, SSFUMC uh, to the number 84576, and that will get you into our, our Friday emails that go out and, and kind of keep you up to date. But I want to share a few things that are happening this week that are important. Uh, first and foremost, uh, today, and many of you I'm sure saw it on the way in, um, our children's department is having a, a baked goods and arts um, fundraiser for their summer camp this, this coming summer. And so an opportunity for you to, to help, uh, help those kids uh, get to camp and have a wonderful experience there. So I invite you to look at the table there on your way out. I believe they're also going to move down to the fellowship hall afterwards, and, and so there's, there'll be opportunities there after Sunday school, and just um, help support them. I know they've been baking all weekend and making some wonderful, wonderful artwork that uh, would, would be a great thing to support. Also want to let you know, um, we have been, our church council had been meeting on the last Monday of, of each month to kind of update as we, as we we're working towards a general conference. Well, if, as we kind of heard last week, general conference has, has since been uh, postponed for, I believe, two years. And so um, with all of the uncertainty and upheaval of that, uh, we're not going to meet this Monday. But the, the, our, um, our conference's bishop, Bishop McKee, is going to be in Greenville on Saturday, April the 23rd at 10.30. Uh, he's going to be there to kind of, a little bit of a state of the union and to answer questions and to talk about what, what it looks like in the Northeast Texas Conference uh, moving forward. Uh, all are invited to attend that if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, our church council will then meet the following Monday after that. It's more of an opportunity there. We'll know a little bit more to be able to discuss as a council, but I want you to have that date in mind uh, and note again if you're on the church council, we will not meet tomorrow night. This is still Lent, and uh, we are working towards uh, the, the glories of Easter Sunday, and so our Lenten lunches are continuing. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, Kyle, excuse me, God, Kyle Ray uh, from Journey Baptist Church will be with us, and uh, our if you have been to the other couple of lunches, they have been fantastic, and Kyle is a wonderful, wonderful guy. It'll be a great opportunity to um, meet and be with him. So come, bring a lunch, join us right in here at noon, and uh, we will have you out of here by 1245. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful time to gather in fellowship. Also want to just put on your calendar uh, coming up, and there's an opportunity to actually register now. Uh, we have a, a fall marriage retreat that we are excited to, to offer. Uh, Jeff Harris, man, I'm going through puberty this morning. It's springtime. <laughs> I, I felt really young this morning. So, But Jeff Harris, who um, pastors at Shannon Oaks Church now, invited us to partner with him. And, and Jeff and Ed and, and, and others are going to help lead this conference. It's uh, at a hotel in Arkansas, um, in, in um, Hot Springs. It's going to be... You can, you can hit that QR code. There's images of that around the church. And there's also in each of the Sunday school classes that's there. Hit that QR code. It will give you more information about the details of that and how to get registered for that. But um, I want to encourage you to do that. I think it's going to be a wonderful event and a, uh, something unique for us that we haven't done in a long time. And, and so look at that if, if that's something that interests you. 
uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that, and we'll speak more to that um, as we get closer to that. Again, thank you for being in here today, and it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day of worship. Yeah, let's stand and sing together this morning. God indeed has fought and has won the battle. Let us stand together and proclaim our 
belief and hope and trust in that in our affirmation of faith this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may have a seat. If you will bow with me in prayer this morning. Gracious God, we are grateful again for an opportunity to just be here in fellowship this morning to to proclaim your victory. To worship the Creator. Lord, I pray that our words and our song this morning find you feeling worshiped. Lord, we are grateful for springtime and changing of the seasons and the beauty that comes with that. God, I pray for those who who need to see a change of season in their life this morning. And to see the beauty that you offer through your love and your grace and your forgiveness. God, I pray for those this morning that that are in need of healing. God, I know there are families in our church who have lost loved ones in this past week. We lift we lift their hearts to you this morning that that they know the the truth and can see the the joy in knowing that their loved one is is in your presence this morning. And God, I pray for those who are in the midst of changes in their careers or changes in their family. God, may they know that that your walk with them is, is the same today as it was yesterday and it will be the same tomorrow, that you are present and with them always. And God, forgive us when we, when we turn and run or focus on ourselves and, and miss the opportunities before us to, to be a light for you, to be your hands and your feet. God, I pray for all those who are in Ukraine and in that area that are seeking to help the refugees that that are trying to find safety and peace. And God, you know all the inner workings of that, that situation, and we place that at your feet this morning and ask for your grace and your healing. But God, we, we come here... We're blessed to have the opportunity and the, to have the freedom to gather here as, as a family of believers this morning to share your love with one another and come and pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom.
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and stand together. nothing that you can't do and, and there's not a, a, a prison door that you can't break through and so Lord we, you, you know our hearts you know 
the mountains that we desire you to move. And we ask that you would move them. But Lord, we also know that perhaps the greatest thing that needs to move is, is our own hearts. That you, you just need to remove the bars from our own hearts so that we can have the confidence and the trust to follow you and, and to trust you with all of life. So we pray that you'll do that today. We pray that by your sovereign grace, you will move in our hearts today and that you will give us your word of grace and your word of truth that you would remind us that you are so that you are faithful and that you are trustworthy. We pray for the rest of this service. We pray for our children as they go to children's church. Father, we pray that you would speak to their hearts today. Just your 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 special word of grace and truth that they would hear once again who you are. And we commit all of this to you and we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Would you be seated? So we continue our series through Lent called Counterintuitive. You guys have a great children's church. If you have your Bible, open it please to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, we're going to read verses 27 through 36. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from One who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Crazy. (laughs) Just crazy, crazy, crazy love. Now, that's probably not the most sophisticated way to describe what Jesus is teaching, but that's just what comes to my mind as I think about this teaching on love. N.T. Wright says it like this, the kingdom that Jesus preached and lived was all about a glorious, uproarious, absurd generosity. Think about the best thing you could do for the worst person and go ahead and do it. It's crazy kind of love. Now, the word love is, is listed six times in this particular passage. It it comes from agapeo or agape. It's God's love. It's for God so loved the world kind of love. It's it's a love not not, not so much based on emotion, but rather commitment to somebody else's well-being. It's the kind of love that God has for us. It's the kind of love that God commands his people to share with others Six times it's mentioned in here, but it really permeates the entire passage. Everything in this passage is about loving others. And it's a crazy-sounding kind of love. 
So let's jump into it and kind of unpack just how crazy it is. First of all, it is obedient. So this passage of Scripture is part of a larger sermon we call the Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain. It's similar to another sermon Jesus preached called the Sermon on the Mount. You probably remember that from Matthew. It's similar in context. Tent, but, but there are some differences. The first difference is that the Sermon on the Mount was preached on a mountain. The Sermon on the Plain was preached on a level place, on a plain. It's, it's a different sermon in a different time and in a different place. It's much shorter, much shorter than the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters. The Sermon on the Plain is one chapter. It's also interesting how Luke describes the audience that's listening. Jesus says, or Luke says, there was a great crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people. So at this point in Jesus' ministry, there are a lot of people who call themselves disciples. And so this great crowd of disciples have come to Jesus as well as this great multitude of people. And with that, let's begin with verse 27. But I say to you who hear, let me say that again, but I say to you who hear. The word hear in this context denotes people who don't just listen to Jesus' words, but who will obey Jesus' words. And so from the very beginning of this passage, Jesus narrows this large group of disciples to an even smaller group. There will be those who will obey his teaching And there will be those who will not obey his teaching. And these two groups, they exist even today, to be sure. There are those who obey Jesus' teaching, and then there are those who don't obey Jesus' teaching. Why is that? I think it's because it's so crazy sounding. I think it's because it's so absurd and uproarious. It just so it runs so counter to how we normally think about life and how life works. G.K. Chesterton put it like this, and I love this statement. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a great statement and a true statement. Christianity so often has not been tried and found wanting. It's just looked upon as so difficult and people don't even try it. Crazy love begins first with obedience. Number two, it's counterintuitive. I mean, it it just seems to make no sense. In fact, it almost seems like nonsense. You read this and you're like, Jesus, this does not work in 21st century Hopkins County, USA. It might have worked for you. It might have worked in the ancient world. But seriously, this this kind of stuff does not work in modern day America. And yet, Jesus is relentless with his teaching. So before we get too far into this, it's important, I think, to make a few observations about this text because It is easy, and it has been misread over the centuries. So let me give you three quick misreadings that have often happened over the centuries. The first is that Jesus is teaching, kind of giving a policy of national passivism. That is not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is not laying out a policy of national passivism. Um, he's not doing that at all. And we can make a strong argument against that. This is not about national pacifism. If you read it and you're like, love your enemies, don't strike back. Clearly Jesus is telling us we're supposed to be pacifists. That, that, that is not what he's saying in this. And we could go on about that. A second misreading is that Jesus is, he, he is, Jesus is not teaching us how to run a business, right? I mean, you read this and you're like, what are you saying, Jesus? Like, if I have a product and people steal it, I'm not supposed to, like, want to get... Is that how you run a business? Jesus is not teaching about business tactics or um, how to run a business. And, And third, Jesus is not promoting injustice. You read this and you're like, Jesus doesn't care anything about people who get taken advantage of. 
That, that is simply not the case at all. You read through Jesus' words and the teachings of Jesus. There's nobody in the Bible that stands up for the oppressed and those who are taken advantage of more than Jesus. And so this is not about national pacifism. It's not about how you run a business. It's not promoting injustice. Jesus is talking to his disciples about how his disciples should live in the world. He's talking to his disciples about how disciples should live in the world and how they should react in interpersonal relationships with one another. But having said that, it doesn't take away at all from the uproarious, outlandish, crazy demand that this places on our lives if we rightly understand what Jesus is saying. It's incredible what Jesus is saying here. Let's go through these verses. Let's just go back through them. He says this, love your enemies. Now pause there for a moment. Uh, This word enemy denotes somebody who is bent on inflicting harm on you. Love your enemies. Those who are bent on inflicting harm on you. This has no precedent in the ancient world, scholars say. The ancients who were listening to this they, they love their family, they love their kin, they love their allies. They might show mercy on their enemies, but they didn't love them. And Jesus says, listen, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Let's keep reading. Do good to those who hate you. The word good means to treat honorably, to treat nobly. Treat honorably, treat nobly those who hate you. This word hate can mean to detest. Those people who detest you, treat them honorably. But it doesn't necessarily have to mean detest because this word elsewhere is used like as a comparative word. It could mean just like loving somebody less or esteeming someone less than somebody else. In other words, like they don't have to detest me. They might just snub their nose at me and I am to treat them nobly. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's easier for me to try to do good to people who hate me than those who simply ignore me or snub me. Jesus continues, bless those who curse you. The word bless in the Greek, eulogio. Think of the word eulogy. Question, what do you do when you eulogize someone in a funeral? You speak well of them. You like heap praises on them. You, you, you say good things about them. Jesus says, speak good things about people who curse you. Think about people who curse you. Speak about people who speak ill of you. Jesus says, listen, don't trade shots. Rather, speak good upon them. Speak well about them. That's, that's crazy. Crazy. Pray for those who abuse you. Pray for those who abuse you. What a strong word that is. And the word pray here, or the idea of praying here is not, God, I want you to smote that person right now. It's, it's a different kind of prayer. It's praying in, enveloped in love. God, God, I pray for that person. Pray for those who abuse you. It's interesting, this word um, abuse here. It has this sense, the, scholar, the lexicon says, it's not just abusiveness in general, but scholars say this. This is the wording from the lexicon. This is like tailor-crafted abuse, custom-tailored reviling. So it's one thing to deal with people who just have this general abusive personality. I bet everybody knows people like that. He's talking about here probably people who have like targeted you. It's not just generalized abusive personalities. It's like tailor-made abuse towards you. Now, let me tell you, that's a different level of love right there. And maybe you know that. Maybe you've actually had somebody not just have an abusive personality around you, but but like they, they, they handcrafted an assault against you. Maybe at work or at school. Maybe... In the community or around, Jesus like, love and pray for those who've even handcrafted, tailor-made an assault on you. To the one, let's just keep reading. (laughs) 
To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. Now, the implication here is not so much physical pain, though it could have some physical pain. The real issue here is insult. In the ancient world, one of the most common and one of the most humiliating forms of insult was for a person to just kind of flippantly backhand you across the cheek. It very often happened when a person of higher social status did that to a person of lower social status. And guess what? They could do nothing about it. Just like, pew. it's an insult. And Jesus is like, listen, when, when you are insulted like that, don't insult back. Just take it. Are you crazy? Turn the other cheek, he says. The next two I want to put together. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. The cloak was the outer garment. Very valuable because it kept you warm. In fact, oftentimes this is all people had to keep them warm at night. Jesus says, if somebody takes your cloak, give them your shirt also. Give to everyone who begs from you. Begging was very common. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Now, this is, this is fascinating. I put these two together because I think they're linked in this way. In both of these verses, you have somebody who has something and someone who doesn't have something taking from the person who does. And, and maybe what Jesus is getting at here is maybe if somebody steals your cloak, just maybe they, they need it. I mean, really and truly, maybe they need it in their own life. And maybe if somebody takes money from you or your goods and they, they, they don't repay... Maybe they don't repay because they cannot repay. Maybe what Jesus is getting at here, and he doesn't excuse the behavior. He's just saying there, there's, there's, there's a motive probably that is real deep here. And, and I want to sort of take that idea of motive and apply it to the rest of all of these. Maybe the person who has become your enemy. Maybe the person who uh, hates you. Maybe the person who curses you. Maybe the person who abuses you. Maybe the person who insults you. Maybe, maybe, maybe they do that because there's a motive that we're not even aware of. Right? Maybe there's something going on in their heart, their mind, their life, their family, their job. Maybe something is going on that nobody is even aware of. And Jesus says, love that person. And it all comes down to verse 31. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. We call this the golden rule, right? The golden rule. Now, Jesus' listeners and hearers, they would have been familiar with similar sayings. There were at least two variations of this in the ancient world. One, one stressed reciprocity. It's like, do good to people so that they will do good to you. But that, that's not at all what Jesus is saying. Like, There's no reciprocity here. It's not like, hey, do good to somebody so he'll do good back. It's like, do good to people whether or not they do good back to you. The other variant was written in the negative. Don't do bad things to people that you wouldn't want them to do to you. And this is not written in the negative. This is proactive. This is in the positive. Before they ever do anything, and even if they never repay, just do good to people. You know how you want to be treated, says Jesus. Just do that. I think it's important, and I like this statement from N.T. Wright. He says, Jesus is not, he's not giving a rule book. He's not laying out a list of do's and don'ts that are rigid and ironclad in any and every situation. That's not what he's doing. What he is doing, quote, is giving us an attitude of the heart, a lightness of spirit in the face of all that the world can throw at you. So it's not like this necessarily ironclad, rigid thing that applies to any and every circumstances. It's not a rule book. It's, it's an issue of the heart. Just, it's the awareness that, listen, no matter what somebody throws at you, no matter what someone does to you, the heart can take a different posture. The heart can take a different posture. And it's crazy to us. Number three, it's holy. So God calls his people to be holy. Referencing the Old Testament, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, But just as he 
who called you as holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Holy means to be set apart. To be set apart from the world. To be set apart for God. Holy means to live different than the rest of the world. And even though the word holy is not in this passage, the whole thing is about being holy. The whole thing. I mean, look at, look at what he says. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even the sinners do that. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that? Even the sinners do that. And if you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lead to sinners and get back the same amount. Peterson translates it like, you know what? If you give something and you expect something back, don't call it charity. The point is, this is all about living holy. It's it's about living different from the rest of the world. And, And the ultimate expression of holy is Jesus who lived out every one of these he loved his enemies he did good to those who hated him he blessed those who cursed him he prayed for those who abused him he did not strike back to those who struck him it's been said that the greatest need is for those who call themselves Christ followers to actually live like they are following Christ I hear that statement, and everything in me wants to boil up and recoil. And yet, Jesus' words, I don't know about you, but they strike me to the core. Number four, crazy love is rewarded love, though. It's rewarded love. Look at verse 35, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. So I could uh, 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 talk about the rewards that God offers in a number of ways. Let me just give you three quick ways. I won't even reference the Scriptures, but if you, if you study the Scriptures yourself, you'll, you'll know this to be true. There are some rewards that are only realized in in eternity, in heaven. We, we won't even see them. We won't even experience them. And we won't realize them until we step into glory, into heaven. And so some rewards we receive, we will not even realize until we step into eternity. There are other rewards that we will receive here and now. I mean, Jesus talks about, listen, when you give up things for me, Listen, there is blessing in return to that. It may be costly, but there is indeed a blessing that comes from that. It may not come in a check. It may not be dollars and cents, but but there's a blessing that comes from willingness to follow me. But perhaps the greatest reward of all, and it's found in verse 35, is that when we live and love like this, we are identified as children of the Most High God. And is there a greater reward than that? It's perhaps the most overused sermon illustration of the past 20 years. But I'm going to use it again. It comes from Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. It's the Lion, the Witch, the Wardrobe. There's that scene where Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are talking to Susan, the little girl. And and yes, if you remember, they are talking beavers. And they're talking about Aslan, the lion, the Christ figure. And Susan says, he's a lion? I I thought he would be a man. Is is he safe? I, I would be very nervous to meet a lion. And Mr. Beaver says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. He's good. There is nothing in the teachings of Jesus that is safe. Nothing. If we want safe, man, we've got to, we better find another Lord. But he is good. Innately good. And finally, crazy love is motivated love. Back to verse 35. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. The word kind is the Greek word uh, krestos. It means furnishing that which is helpful or useful in a given situation. 
The F.F. Bruce tells us that in the ancient world, slave, this was a common name for slaves. They were named kind because they were helpful. They were useful. Jesus is saying, listen, God is kind. God is helpful. God is useful. Even to the ungrateful and the evil. He continues, be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Merciful, moved with compassion, visceral kind of compassion. This, this crazy love that Jesus talks about is anchored in this. It's anchored in the love of God for us. So, here's the takeaway. The takeaway is simply this. Trust and obey. They ought to make a hymn named that. Trust and obey. That's what we're talking about in this text. Trust and obey. Let's start with trust. The only way, I think, the only way, because I I don't do this well at all. The only way to love like this is to trust that God is the rewarder. To trust that God is the benefactor. If I believe that my ultimate well-being is based on how other people treat me, then there's no way I can live like this. But if I really believe that my ultimate well-being is not based on how others treat me, but how God treats me, now that, that, that gives me the grace to love like this. Let's trust confidence in him and and obey remember jesus is talking to two different types of people he's talking to people who will listen and not obey he was talking to those who will hear and obey now none of us perfectly obey this we're all in process we're all wrecks (laughs) we're all cracked pots as they say but that shouldn't keep us from striving as christ followers to want to do this The Lord's really been wrestling with me on this. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We are in need of continual repentance. But remember this. Repentance does not disqualify someone from serving Jesus. In fact, it requalifies someone to serve Jesus. It's the ability just to say, Lord, I messed up. And I'm doing the best I can. Forgive me. I want to follow you. So here are the two questions I'll leave you with. What keeps you from trusting God in this capacity? What keeps you from trusting God in in being able to love the unlovable? And what do you need to do to obey? Perhaps let go of resentment or vengeance. Let go of anger. Let go of greed. Perhaps let go of pride. Someone has attacked your reputation. What is it that you personally need to do to be able to love this crazy kind of love? You know, as crazy as this sounds, i got to be honest, I think this is the kind of love that grabs people's hearts and changes people's minds. We have so watered down, and I count myself as guilty we've so watered down the call of jesus on our lives that often jesus appears more as a butler than the lord of lords we work him into our schedules we serve him when it is convenient we have created a jesus who is almost kind of a take it or leave it kind of a jesus and sadly the truth is when we presented that over the decades sadly And statistics show this. There are way many more people leaving it rather than taking it. I think we need to let the lion roar. Let the lion roar. He says what he says to Ed Lance and to all of us. And those who have ears to hear, those who are willing to repent and continually say, Lord, here I am. They will hear and they will follow. I pray that I be counted among that group. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for your word of grace and truth. It's coming straight from the text. Oh God, we hear 
the call of Jesus on our lives. And it is so intimidating. It unravels us. And yet, this is Jesus and none other. Forgive us where we have failed. We entrust this once again to you. Give us the grace to serve you. Give us the grace to love as you loved and entrust it all to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So perhaps there's something you'd like to pray about. I'd love to, I'd love to pray with you if you'd like to pray about anything. I'm going to be standing over here. I want to invite you to stand, but even if you don't come forward and pray to pray, I, my guess is hearing a text like this, I mean, it, you're a child of God. You can't hear a text like that and, 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 and not wrestle with it. I, and, and let us wrestle with it together. Um, but if you'd like to pray with somebody, I'd love to pray with you. Whatever your prayers, maybe it has nothing to do with that text or the message. Maybe there's just something happening in your life. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, uh, I'd love to pray with you. Tammy, would you come and, and um, stand on the other side? And, and uh, she's available to pray as well. And you stand.
So Jesus ends that particular section by saying, Be merciful, for your Father is merciful. And He is so merciful. I mean, that's the story of the gospel, is that out of love for us, God moved with compassion, became flesh. And Jesus died as the atoning sacrifice for our sins on the cross. Out of compassion, He was moved for you and me. And he bled and he died for our forgiveness, for our redemption, for our reconciliation to the Father. That's, that's the motive of it all. That we are merciful because God is merciful. I'm going to wrestle with this text this week. And I suspect that you will too. And so as you go forth, would you receive this benediction? Go forth and wrestle well. Go forth and let the words of Jesus unravel you as it has unraveled me this week. Let us be reminded the call to love the unlovable. But let us be reminded above all that in our state of being unlovable, He loved us first. Go forth with with that promise, knowing that you are loved. And may his love live through you. Amen and amen. See you next week. Sacrifice was made as the hell.